welcome to Kirsten. It's very good to talk to you. Um, I must say this book of yours, the book of editing, this is an extraordinarily wide ranging book. It's one that examines theatre and science from every possible angle, ranging from environment and ecology to medical science and technology. Perhaps we could just begin, though, by your telling us um, how you chose these 14 essays, both the subjects and indeed the writers. They're all specialists in their field, but could you give them a general introduction? Well, thank you, Michael, for that question and for, for um, being willing to, to do this event. It's, it's such a privilege to speak to you um, and to gain from your experience. 10,000 reviews is <laughs> no mean feat. Um, I, I, um, I did want to mention the choice of topics and, and chapter subjects and the overall scope of the book being completely driven really by um, kind of from the grassroots up, in other words, by my contributors. Um, they are the heart and soul of the book. And I knew I just wanted the best possible contributors, um, you know, people in the, leading the field right now. Um, and so I was very happy just to invite them and have them essentially say, here's what I want to write on um, in most cases. And I think that that is just delightful to see the book kind of come come to life and emerge from what they're interested in uh, and expert on. So um, do you mind if I actually just read out the, the list of contributors? Because they, they really are the book. Um, and I hope some of them are listening right now. So in order of the chapters, we have Dan Rebellato, Jane R. Goodall, Karina Bartleet, Carl Lavery, Una Chowdhury and Joshua Williams writing a chapter together, Stanton B. Gar Garner Jr., Finton Walsh, John Van, Mike Vandenhoevel, Michael Kirkland, Rhonda Blair, Amy Cook, Frederic Aituati, and myself. Well, I mean, th those 14 experts, including yourself, cover, as I said, a huge range of subjects. Uh, can I start there by asking you about the interaction between <clears throat> science and theatre. You say there has been a lot of that interaction in recent years. Has it always been there? Has it been there as part of theatrical history, if you like, but we just haven't written about it until fairly recently? Um, that's such a good question. I mean, I, I tried to tackle this in my first book on theatre and science, which is called Science on Stage, and realised it would be multi multiple volumes um, just to tackle how far back theatre and science really go. I think in the end, I, I was able to give it a kind of overview in, a, in an introductory sense and just decided I'm going to start with Dr. Faustus by Marlowe and The Alchemist by Ben Jonson. But of course, you could go back to the Greeks. You could go back to plays by Aristophanes. Um, there, there are just so many really interesting examples that there, there wasn't scope to cover in, in that very brief history. In addition, I think the the emergence of modern scientific specialization, um, science as a discipline in a general sense anyway, um, I think the term science comes into being around in the 1830s, um, and before then it was natural philosophy. So there's a, a sense in which it's a modern concept, modern science as we know it, um, really kicks off around that time in the early 19th century, and and the specialization then becomes quite quite interesting in terms of theater's engagement with discrete fields. So that's something that became obvious to me with the phenomenon of the the kind of contemporary science play, if you will, which was what my first book looked at, that sense in which there are physics plays and there are biology plays and there are doctor plays. Um, but I hope that this book takes it much further and looks at what things have, have developed since then, because the field has changed a lot. And that's one of the things this book tries to show. There has always, as you say, there been this connection, hasn't been theater and science. I was very struck the other day, I came across a quote by a director from the early 20th century called William Pohl. And he said uh, he saw theatre as a laboratory for research into humanity. And that's a fascinating phrase, isn't it? Does that suggest to you that almost all theatre, in some sense, has its roots in science? If theatre is a research into humanity, then King Lear is a scientific play as much as Michael Frayn's Copenhagen, isn't it? That's a really interesting idea. Yes, um, you could go further back, actually. You could actually look at Zola. Emile Zola's great um, 
manifesto of, of naturalism in the theater that in many ways set us on a path to uniting science and theater more overtly by calling for a kind of microscopic examination and observation and trying to be objective um, in, in examining hu humanity. But at the same time, and this is the first chapter in the book, actually Dan Rebellato's chapter looks very closely at this idea that, that this in a way set us on a, uh, a faulty path in some respects because, because of the then the sort of deference to some fixed meaning of objectivity and objectivity as, as somehow removed from subjectivity completely. But it's shown to be um, much more, it's much murkier than that and, and much fuzzier, that line. And that's, that's kind of something that theater and science exploits very much. Um, so it's that, that idea of the fixity of scientific observation and the reliability, these things get questioned over and over in uh, plays that deal with science. But the idea of the uh, of close observation of humanity, I think that's absolutely right. That is, that is also something you see, um, for example, in studies of, in studies of uh, the family unit, if you will. So I've de devoted a lot of time to looking at evolution in, in the theater. And it all very much comes back to this, this study of human behavior, um, the family as this kind of uh, unit uh, in different permutations and how plays explore that. Um, and it might seem almost counterintuitive to think, well, how can you stage evolution? That's a great example of theater's engagement with science sometimes seeming counterintuitive because evolution is not usually something you can see, let alone for two hours in the theater. But yeah. that's exactly the kind of area that theater makers have often jumped into happily because precisely because of that challenge. Could we home in on one or two specific essays? I was very struck by one which you mentioned a moment ago. Um, it's by um, Fintan Walsh and it's called Urban Contagion. And it <clears throat> cites two plays specifically, uh, Albert Camus' The Plague, which was revived only last year, and Arin C. Kane's uh, play Misty. The play obviously is about a city quarantine, quarantined from the outside world. And um, Arinzi Kane's play, Misty, posits the idea of a virus spreading through a whole city. Now, when I read that chapter today, I mean, my eyes were out on stalks. I thought, my gosh, this chapter is actually writing about the condition of the pandemic, the condition that we're in now. I mean, have some, some specific chapters acquired a new urgency, if you like, because of the situation we're in today. Yes, absolutely. I mean, Finton's chapter, he would have written this a couple of years ago. Um, we know how long it takes for books to, to come to fruition. And it's prescient. I mean, absolutely, in many ways, especially the close look at how the pandemic has um, unequally um, uh, affected different communities, people of color, immigrants. Um, this is something that absolutely is is part of his focus. And uh, he's also had a long-standing interest in theater and contagion. His previous book is, is actually called Theaters of Contagion. And there is, of course, also that, that long history of theater being um, essentially vilified, for example, by the Puritans as being a, a place of contagion. And this could be a bodily contagion as well as a mental one. It can be theater as a place where ideas um, you know, spread and affect and infect people. And so they, theater can be dangerous. So there, there are many senses in which that chapter touches absolutely on different notions of contagion, whether physical or social, um, but absolutely looks at in a, in, a, in a way that is completely resonant with our situation now, how contagion manifests itself um, in these particular communities. As you were saying that, I suddenly thought of Oedipus, of course, Oedipus Rex by Sophocles. Yeah. Again, they all about plague and contagion, isn't it? That he's spreading through uh, a city of thieves. Um, yes. Another chapter that, that leapt out at me was that by John Venn on mental health. And it cites to his play specifically, Joe Pennell's Blue Orange, and Lucy Preble's The Effect. And I was struck by that because in the last year, I seem to have seen a number of works <clears throat> on this subject. It, it's, the, it's one of the big topics of theatre at the moment. Just to mention too, there was a production called Reasons to Stay Alive based on a book by Matt Hay, which is all about depression. Um, there was another play I saw called Chemistry, which is an American play about 
a manic, uh, falling in love with the depressive. Um, is is this topic? Do you think <clears throat> is mental health? Is that one of the urgent topics which theatre is now having to address because we because of our heightened awareness of the subject in society? Yes, absolutely. I think we're only going to see more plays about this. And, and when I say plays, I also am obviously um, being as broad as possible in terms of the kinds of theatre that engage with um, mental health issues and, and, and other issues. So the book very much roams across devised theatre, immersive theatre, um, all kinds of, of plays as well as lecture performances, for example, in the case of, of uh, climate change. And um, your mention of the 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 plays you've just the plays you've just cited actually um that engage with mental health it makes me think of that one every brilliant thing by duncan mcmillan which mm -hmm. also was a different kind of play it was not um a sort of single authored play in this traditional sense he i don't know if you you remember that but he had pieces of paper that the audience that kind of the audience read out at certain places in the in the performance and they had to improvise and they had to take on certain roles and they had to be different characters but it was really complicated and it was so effective and so this sort of uh almost experimental theater is uh, it brings a new dimension to that word experimental theater i think as we were talking about as you were talking about mental health i was just thinking um does theater have an educational aspect when it comes to science. In other words, it heightens our awareness, it increases our understanding, it makes things more available. There's a line, actually, I remember now in the Matt Haig play, it begins, uh, the trouble with depression, it's invisible. But of course, the task of the theatre is to make the invisible visible. I mean, all I'm really asking is a simple question. I mean, do, do plays with a scientific background or context, do they increase our awareness? Is that one of their functions? Yes, I think they do. Um, at the same time, I'm very careful not to assume that they have a didactic purpose um, necessarily, that, that their first function is to teach. I, I don't think that's that's the case. Uh, it depends what kind of theatre you're talking about, of course, but um, and, and every kind of theatre that engage with, engages with science will be doing so in a different way. Uh, but but as soon as an audience starts to feel lectured at, I think they sort of want to run the other way. Um, and so there's a kind of uh, line drawn actually by Mike Vandenheuvel in his chapter, where he talks about the ex explicative type of theater. So explication theater, as opposed to exploration. And there is a kind of theater where it's more about the audience helping to construct the meaning. The meaning. So there's a there's a sense of science um, not necessarily just being explained to you, but it, it's experienced. Uh, it's very much about that immersion in ideas, and it, a lot of it might not be sticking. It might not be, um, you know, being assimilated. But there is a sense in which what's really important is the experience of some form of the science, some kind of engagement with the ideas, because you can't, you just can't ram it down an audience's throat, can you? Well, I think sometimes you can. I mean, can I pick <laughs> up this said? Because I, I was thinking a specific example. There was a wonderful lecture quotes play uh, by Michael Robert Emmett, uh, and it was called Ten yeah. Bill. I saw it at the what did upstairs, and this was a straightforward lecture, if you like, mm -hmm. by English Cambridge scientist about the dangers we are facing of population explosion. And he was giving us a screen of information with lots of diagrams and illustrations. And it was theatrical in that sense, but it was a lecture. And we came out of that experience, I mean, chastened, informed, and mostly horrified, I say, because he, he almost argued there was no hope for mankind unless governments took action, individual action said could help, but it can't change the situation. That was a lecture play, basically. So Michael, was it, was it theatrical? Well, I would say it was, in, in that it was one man talking to a group of spectators using visual aids. Obviously, it was directed by Katie Mitchell, as I remember. Um, yeah. But it, it took the format, if you like, of a university lecture. And I think that can be highly dramatic and highly theatrical because of the content, of course, and because of the way he uh, put this put this subject across to us. All I'm saying what is, I think, think... Sorry, I think go there, on. There, there, there is a room occasionally for the didactic. And I think 
the, the climate crisis is one area where didactic theatre might have a function. Yeah, I'm really interested in this, actually. I mean, wh whether what is the uh, what are the emerging forms of climate change theatre? Because how can how can one kind of theatre necessarily um, encompass the challenges? It, it's such an interdisciplinary problem in itself. Um, and it's difficult to contain in an evening of theater, if you will. I think we've discovered there are different ways of tackling climate change, aren't there? With the climate crisis, Steve Waters, as you remember, wrote two plays, didn't he? I think linked plays. Yeah. That was straightforward conventional drama. There was a, a piece called, is it 2071, 271, which the Royal Court stage, which is mentioned in your book, actually, which again yeah. was a quasi lecture um, with a lot of information given. So it was Greenland, I think, at the National, which was a rather um, unfortunate multi-authored piece, didn't quite work. But I think people are discovering there are endless ways to tackle that particular subject. Yeah, and also um, extinction. So one of the chapters in in in, in the book actually has um, has a, a focus on a practitioner called Deke Weaver, who yes. is essentially devoting his whole career to different animals that are going extinct or that are threatened with extinction and so he's got a he's got a piece called wolf he's got a piece called tiger he's he's got all these different pieces that take you out into nature you as an audience member are taken to the habitat or, or a simulated habitat um, and the idea i think is to experience again it's experience Rather than sitting and watching something necessarily staged, you become part of that, part of that experience, part of that staging. So it, it does raise the issue of whether there's a an overlap there and a kind of um, experimental mode that theater sometimes can inhabit, perhaps similar to to science. Well, this is an unfortunate non sequitur, but I was going to say there are endless ways to skin a cat, and obviously there are endless ways not to tackle science in the theatre. Can I come on to your own essay in the book, uh, which is about the science of doing theatre, making theatre, a new focus on scenography and lighting, the use of labour uh, backstage, etc. A fascinating, fascinating essay. Um, I wonder if, if you feel that subject is developing all the time. Quite simply, because of the crisis we're now in, doing theatre is taking on a different form, isn't it? It's now becoming uh, streamed, more often than not. I mean, that is how most people this year, I suspect, have received their theatre. Not by sitting in auditoria, not by sitting with other people, by sitting at home, watching as they are now, I suppose, streamed information. Is, is, that, is, that, is, that a, is that a temporary phenomenon, or do you think it will outlast the current crisis we're in? Will people want streamed theatre coming to their home by their screens? Well, I'm really hoping that people will be so fed up with that exact thing that they'll stampede for the actual theater. Um, theaters are really some of the hardest hit cultural institutions, as, as we know, because of the pandemic. And it would just be, it's unimaginable how hard it must be to have, essentially have your business model completely um, wrecked in, uh, you know, overnight. And, um, and, and I think I, I would be cautious about hoping that streaming theater and, and moving to more um, online events and, and so on um, is a permanent thing. I would, I would like to think that maybe it's just another manifestation of the incredible imagination and flexibility and creativity of, of theater to adapt so quickly to such challenging circumstances. But at the same time, nothing can change the fact that we have big empty theater spaces that need to be filled that, you know, that that's what pays the bills. Um, so I, I, I would hope that we can have a, a continuation of the old, the old kind pre-pandemic, as well as capitalizing on what we've learned from having to adapt, to, from having to stream and create new kinds of, of interactive online events. You talked about the continuous interaction between science and theatre, that this has been going on, as you suggest, for centuries. Um, but has there been a seismic shift, do you think, in recent years, not only in the increasing study of science and theatre, but in the fact that plays like the Hagen, uh, Tom Stoppard's Arcadia, have attracted huge audiences and have achieved global popularity? Is that a remarkable historic moment? Do you think? Possibly. I'm, I'm not very good at pinpointing great historic moments. Um, 
probably we're just living through them, so it's hard to pinpoint them. But maybe um, I sort of tried to say this in the theater and science book that I first wrote, the science on stage one, in in trying to say, look, there's this phenomenon of the science play. Um, there's this really noticeable rise of instances of putting science on stage. And it really was kind of after 1945, because the relationship of of uh, the public to science became really fraught um, because of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and then we had the internet. So I'm making lots of big leaps here, but the availability of scientific information to the general reader, the general audience, surely create, is one of the biggest shifts that, we, that we've seen. You can look things up, you can find out information, you can diagnose yourself if you have um, symptoms of something. I mean, it's it's just it's just incredible what is at our fingertips. But at the same time, how has that possibly changed our relationship to ideas about science, ideas about the production of knowledge, um, the real, reliability of science, and and the sources that we're consulting, and so on. So there's a there's a there are a number of really fraught questions that I think a lot of plays are are in, interested in pursuing, but also not just in their subject matter, but in their form. So there's a lot of interest in the process of doing theater and science to so the kinds of, as I mentioned, I think devised and immersive theater that, that doesn't just present a fixed text, um, but actually asks the audience to participate in the production of the knowledge and to evaluate at the end, what have we learned? What are we experiencing? What have we, uh, where have we come? So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it's a complicated situation actually. Um, because it goes to the heart of why there has been such an interest in in uh, the engagement between theater and science. Uh, you talk of form, and that, that's fascinating, because I see a fundamental difference between plays that tell and plays that show. By that I mean plays that actually demonstrate the subject they're talking about and plays that discuss it. I mean, a classic example, it seems to me, of uh, who show the complicity in their work on theatre, that you know, the famous work about mathematics which features in your book. Is it a disappearing number? Yeah. A bit, yeah, a disappearing number, yeah. Which actually puts a mathematician on stage and shows the mathematical process. Brilliant, amazing piece yeah. of work. The audience accepts that. Contrast that with a play not mentioned in your book, but mentioned in your other book, uh, book Proof by an American writer, David Auburn, <clears throat> about a girl who, <clears throat> if I remember, sort of outwits her uh, father and comes up with the scientific, a complicated scientific theory that happens off stage. My point is with mnemonic, you know, and with uh, disparate number and with the work of complicity and other people as well, the work is happening in front of you. The scientific evidence is in front of you. In that Broadway play proof, it's 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 uh, it's sort of it's considered almost too much for the audience to take. Do you see the point I'm making? There is this distinction between the show and tell, and one is much better than the other. I think. Yeah, well, what what's your experience though? Because you're the person to ask. You've sat through many a play where you've had the science explained. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. What's your experience been of of comparing those kinds of theater? Well, my experience is I think audiences are capable of taking much more information than was assumed in the past. I think that's one of the most recent developments. And I, as I said earlier, the proof is in the success of plays like Copenhagen and Arcadia which are not shy, it seems to me, of explaining uh, nuclear physics, mathematics, uh, chaos theory. You know, we understand it because it's being demonstrated in front of us. Um, in the old-fashioned scientific play, people sit around and talk about science in proof or going back much further play, like the physicists by people doing that. So I think we've made an advance in recent years. I think audiences are wanting to see for themselves. As I said, that play about depression, that I saw last year, depression was made visible in that play uh, by splitting the main character into two different selves. So my, all I'm suggesting is I think we made formal advances and we're much more daring uh, than we used to be. Audiences will take much more than they did in the past. Am I right? Possibly, yeah. I mean, I. it's a difficult one because of this sheer proliferation of types of theatrical experience. So I think some of the ones you're referring to are more the single authored play. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And and yes, that absolutely has a place. Um, but I, I think what I'm 
what I'm trying to get at is that there are so many other kinds of plays and, and climate change theater is one example where there's a move away from that single perspective in a way trying to say that that's exactly what's got us where we are that there is only that there's that kind of hegemonic perspective and in fact we need to we need to open it up and and try to take lots of different viewpoints into account and and in, in a sense see if we can tackle this problem of climate change. Um, so climate change theater is an area where there's a lot of uh, diversity of presentation, experiment with, with um, multiple viewpoints, different kinds of processes of doing theater. And it seems to be consistent with the, the kinds of problems that the field itself um, throws up. Well, I'm going to ask you before we open it to other people's questions, one last impossible question for you. Can I throw it at you? And that oh, is, no. hey, here we are. Well, here we are today, in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a crisis globally. Where do we go from here with science and theatre? Because we we have lived through this terrible, terrible crisis, and hopefully some of us have survived. Does does the relationship of science and theatre become even more urgent than it has been in the past? You know, we're not going to go back into escapism, mass escapism. Are we going to want plays that address? scientific realities even more in the future? I think so. I like to think so, that it's just the beginning really, Michael. Um, there's just a, a kind of openness here in terms of what you can explore uh, in, in the way in which theater engages with science. I don't see any dead ends. I, I see, what did I jot down here? When I was thinking about this issue that, that might come up of new directions. Um, I mean, when I wrote the first book, there was, we didn't have climate change on stage. It was, it was strange that there was climate change, obviously, but um, the closest thing was Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth. There really wasn't much um, interest in putting climate change on stage. So that's a really big area. You, you also have uh, the rise of what is referred to as um, interdisciplinarity, but it's it's, you know, it's obviously a fraught issue. Um, the idea that there is no single field that's that's relevant anymore in terms of theaters engagement with, with science. It's really across multiple disciplines, and it's about trying to trying to mix things up and bring different ideas together. Um, so that that can generate a huge number of new kinds of of ideas and problems to to look at. So rather than like a math play or a physics play or a biology play, um, we might think about different ways in which plays are um, tackling a, a problem through a scientific lens, for example, or or looking at a, a broad issue that that covers many scientific and medical domains and possibly even technological domains in one in one evening at the theater. Um, contagion might be one example there. Contagion just has so many different facets to it. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I wonder if that that is, it's not really a definitive answer because I don't have one, but I just like to think that it's really open-ended. And of course, theater and science go, the, the engagement between theater and science goes where the, the science often goes, but in addition, the theater itself is evolving. So we may not yet know what kinds of forms of theater we will see. Um, and I think they've they've led each other. They've been going hand in hand. Um, so so that's that's one very speculative answer. Well, it's a very good answer, and I think that's a good point to <laughs> open up the debate and discussion. To do so, I'm going to have to slightly adjust the image on my screen so I can see uh, the questions coming in, and here they are. And the first one I can see is is our definition of theatre itself changing, as well as our definition of science? What do you think about that one? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think that's absolutely true. And we've just touched on it a bit. Who would have thought a year ago that we would even be having theater in our, in our living rooms, streamed streamed productions, as we've just been talking about? So in, in that sense, out of necessity, we've seen um, the emergence of new kinds of theater we might never have called theater before. Um, but at the same time, there's also a there's an unspoken um, feature of this we haven't mentioned yet, which is the audience. So it's it's really about what the audience is interested in doing, and you can't forget how much the audience actually leads uh, what happens on stage in in a, in a way. So the 
that it's not playwrights sitting in single rooms devising um, pieces necessarily. It's a real sense of what the audience wants and is interested in and is curious about. And I think that is that is the kind of thing that um, you saw with the, the the play about depression. I saw it with Every Brilliant Thing um, and many other kinds of, of theater uh, happening happening now. And perhaps the idea of site-specific theater as well, where you take an audience like um, Deke Weaver's theater that I mentioned, where you take the audience out of its, out of its, uh, I suppose, comfort zone, if you think of a theater as a, a comfort zone. Um, so the, these are just uh, these are just examples. There are many more things we could say about this, but definitely theaters theaters changing. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more because the difference between theater when I started reviewing, which goes way back to 1971 for the Guardian, and 2019 when I finished, was when I started there was sort of there was a sort of consensus about what constituted the act of theater, and it went into certain categories: plays, musicals, etc. Um, when I when I retired or semi-retired. Um, it was, it was, I wouldn't say it was anarchy, but the definition of theatre was had expanded beyond any uh, meaning, really, any coherent meaning. Mm -hmm. In other words, as you hint, I mean, theatre can take place in a building, it can be site specific, it can be in a found space, it can be in someone's front room if you want, it can now be available uh, via a screen that, that people are sitting in front of, it can last 12 hours or it can last 30 minutes. That's another thing that strikes me about the hunger for the inordinate these days in theatre, you know, big, big, um, it, big, engrossing spectacles that start at breakfast and finish at midnight, or plays like Beckett and Pinter plays, you know, that are extraordinarily compressed and tight and compact. I mean, theatre is almost anything these days, and it's redefined all the time. And some dramatist, Carol Churchill, is a classic example. She redefines theatre every time she writes a play, actually, because no play at first yeah. is like the past. And she, again, is someone who's addressed scientific issues in a play like a number. So I'm entirely Yeah, good. yeah, that's a really good point. Actually, let me ask you, because you have this long-standing interest in expertise in Pinter's work. And I, I remember that early on in his career, didn't he say something about um, how theater is not, the audience is not coming to do a crossword puzzle? And they're not going to sit there with the, the, the clues and then fill in the blanks and then everybody goes home and everyone's happy because they did that. Um, that do you think that that is still relevant, that, that sense that you want to push back against the sense of theater as a crossword puzzle, even with all the science in it, that, that people don't want to just have easy answers or solutions or have questions that get, that get answered by the play? What's, what's your sense of that? Absolutely, because my view is that uh, theater changed Massively, actually, late 50s, mid 50s, late 50s, early 60s, Beckett, Pinter, a filmmaker like Antonioni. Uh, none of those gave the audience, as you imply, a compact resolution or a solution. And part of the charm of Beckett or Pinter, or again, a film like La Ventura, is that the audience goes out in a state of speculation and working out for themselves what the ultimate uh, meaning is or what the what the solution if there is a solution is maybe there isn't a solution um, in other words the open-ended play uh, became I think part of our vocabulary and our language around the 1960s and it's got even if it's possible even more open-ended now than it was then I think audiences today would be very suspicious I don't tell you about the importance of a lecture and the validity of a lecture and I think with some subjects like climate change uh, a lecture is a valid approach but on the whole I think audiences now want to be, they want the dignity of having their own solution as they go home or as they disappear into the night. Absolutely. We have open-ended yeah. theatre, not closed theatre now. We have but has it, yeah, Sorry, let me just that. throw one thing in there, is the idea that um, that you, you don't necessarily um, have to know the science. I mean, I think that's a really important aspect of this discussion that you, w I've rarely been to a play where it was, it was uh, like a little club. And if you didn't know the physics or you didn't know the biology, you were out of it. There's a really important aspect to this, which is that it's, it's quite democratic. It's not some kind of elite um, thing that can go over your head. And some of the science plays that are uh, out there that people are talking about, uh, they actually, 
take care of the problem themselves. As you say, it's not that necessarily they explain they explain the science in a kind of luxury way necessarily, but but that there's a demonstration through the combination of scenography and text and acting and, and all of these elements that theater uniquely can bring together. Um, and so 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 there's no um, exclusive aspect to it in my experience. It's not um, leaving people in the dark. I think that is important to to mention because sometimes when I say I work on theater and science, there might be some assumption, oh, wow, that must be so hard. That must be so, you know, um, you must have to study for ages to understand the physics and so on. But but in my experience, most plays don't don't have that, that kind of uh, exclusivity. Can I go to another question? Uh, the second question here, let me just tap onto it, see what it asks. Um, ah, hold on. Uh, can you speak about the connection that seems to be between theatre in university towns and science? That's interesting. Oh, theatre in university towns. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so many, one of the first things that springs to mind is that when plays like Arcadia and Copenhagen started to be done in the in the 90s, they often were done um, in conjunction with a, a panel, a kind of panel of experts or a workshop that brought together physicists and um, chaos theory experts and mathematicians, whatever the subject of the play was in terms of the science, you would get a, a panelist, uh, a, a panel of experts to talk about the scientific aspects to kind of explain them. And it, it's not to say that this always happened in university towns, because this actually happened often with Broadway productions, for instance, but they would be drawing on academics in universities nearby. Um, and then that became a bit of a phenomenon. So often these plays, you would see that wherever it was put on, there was a panel, as if the play needed that kind of support for the audiences to understand the science. I haven't seen that so much recently, but I'm, I, I'm not exactly keeping track, so I'm I'm sure I'll be corrected on that. But it, that was very much a phenomenon um, maybe yeah, 20 years ago. Um, at the same time as there is a real proliferation of uh, campus productions of science plays, probably naturally because um, a play like Copenhagen, a play like Arcadia and so on, these, these will have people on university campuses who will be natural audiences for, you know, because they're, they're specialists in the field. Um, but at the same time, there are theater companies that are devoted solely to science. So, for example, Menagerie Theater Company in Cambridge, um, Indra's Net in Berkeley, California. And the interesting thing there, of course, is Berkeley and Cambridge are both prominent university towns. Um, so that's a there is a real connection um, between universities and science and theater, but it's not necessarily a causal <laughs> relationship. Um, it's a natural home, perhaps. One might think of it that way. Should we go to another question? Uh, let me just uh, pop onto it. I'd like to ask Kirsten if she can give some hints about how the field has changed a lot between her first book on theatre and science and this one. Thanks, says uh, the questioner. So how has the field changed between your two books, those two books? Oh, wow. That's a really great question. Thank you for that. Um, I hope that the contents, if you looked at the contents of uh, the table of contents for my theater uh, science on stage book and the table of contents for this one, in the intervening 14, 15 years, I think you see some of those changes just in the titles of the chapters, the structure of the book. Um, so what I mentioned a bit earlier, that there's a migration that I've done from kind of moving from discrete scientific areas, discrete fields. In the first book, it was physics plays, math plays, um, medical plays, and so on. And then moving much more toward kind of inter interdisciplinary topics, if you will. So for example, in, in the book that, uh, that we're talking about today, The Cambridge Companion, the topic of contagion we've talked about, the topic of mental health, that of course, needs to be that crosses all kinds of areas it's not um, a, a single field it requires expertise and understanding across a range of disciplines um, technology my own chapter talks about technology and theater which 
which has been often um, kind of pushed to the sidelines. And especially I'm looking at things like uh, patents, theatrical patents that drew on a broad range of scientific and technological expertise um, to create kind of theatrical effects that would be that were patented. Um, and then topics like objectivity and experiment and metaphor, these are all things that are in the in the book. So you can see, I hope uh, that gives you a bit of a picture of of how different and, and radically different, in fact, the two books are because moving from the arrangement according to scientific scientific field to the arrangement according to much broader, more interdisciplinary topics is is a really key shift. Yes, I mean to say, I mean there is a huge difference as far as I can see between the two books because the field has expanded hugely in the in the yeah. in fifteen year gap between the two of them. I'm going to go to another question now. Uh, you from this is from Craig, I think. Do you think there is? Do you think that there is a way in which hypothesizing and testing in the scientific method is mirrored by telling and showing using theatrical narrative methods? And a sense as well that as well thematic parallels between and here the um, space is running out between science and theatre. There are also method methodological ones. Shall I just condense that? Do you think well, there is a way in which hypothesizing and testing in the scientific method is mirrored by telling and showing in theatrical narrative methods? A very good question that, isn't it? That's really good. Um, I mean, one thing, one thing you could say, perhaps, if I'm getting that question right, that there is this common ground um, between theater and science in their methodologies, even if they seem so distinct, you know, one thing is taking place in a lab and another is on a stage, but actually, if you think about both of them take, they do have a hypothesis in a way. They've got, they can only go so far in predicting outcomes. There's the, the issue of liveness. So you, um, quite apart from our current situation where we're streaming things, um, in, a, in a kind of more traditional sense, theater puts, puts something out there. It creates the conditions for an experiment, essentially, but it can't necessarily control the outcome. Even if you've rehearsed and performed something a hundred times, every night it'll be slightly different. Every time you do it, it's a different iteration. And the, that's because the conditions cannot be fixed in, in the way, let's say, when you've written a novel and it's permanent. So um, that liveness, that interaction with an audience is part of what determines the, those, those little subtle changes that might make it different, that do make it different in every iteration. And perhaps in the sciences too, then experiment, no matter what you do to try to make it the same every time, you have to repeat it so often because there are exactly those problems, those, I shouldn't say problems because it's exciting, they're those challenges um, of, of the change, the slight changes in conditions that, that will inevitably occur. So it's, I suppose it's partly that liveness that is common to both of them and the unpredictability, no, no matter how much you try to control, um, there, there is always that, that element that you, you can put a hypothesis out there, but you can't necessarily have it be the same, the same outcome. Does that make sense? It's there in the language, isn't it? We talk about experimental theatre, don't we? As if it yeah. is a laboratory experiment. I remember the yeah. great Polish avant-garde director, Grotowski, formed a company in 1965, I think, called Theatre Laboratory. Yes. And also what comes to mind is something I think you quoted in your earlier book, Michael Blakemore, when he directed Kevin Hagen, the Michael Frame play, he said, um, putting on a play is a sort of scientific experiment. So the language of the process is similar in both cases, is it, is it not? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And and uh, so much of that earlier kind of um, experimental theater was about disrupting the whole model of theater that had that really still dominates Western theater um, today. And that is that break that that wall between the audience and the the actors that that sense of a border that that you shouldn't cross. And of course, that was exploded by a lot of these 1960s experiments. Um, and that's that's exactly the commonality, isn't it? That sense of of trying to do something that disrupts the the usual course of, of how things have been done. And so theater, while it goes so far back, it's one of the earliest cultural forms. At the same time, it's constantly re reinventing itself, even though it has the same ingredients very often. It has actors, it has a place of performance, but it's the infinite variations on that 
a set of ingredients in a sense that makes it so experimental. Let me go to a question from Debbie Schotter, which is, what about the current American anti-science movement? What impact will that have on the theatre world? I would expect a number of plays to come out dealing with that. Any, any reaction to that? Well, I think there's always been anti-science. Um, I mean, there's, there's a, in my, in my second um, study of science, science and theatre interacting, which is called Theatre and Evolution, there's a whole discussion of, um, so for example, the, the anti-Darwinian, anti-evolution um, kind of uh, rhetoric, and this goes right back to the, to the 19th century. So th there is definitely always skepticism in that, in that vein. Um, I would say though that theater, I think theater, I don't know if this is answering the question, but, but theater doesn't always simply dutifully reflect the science back that it engages with. And this is the interesting thing to me, is that actually it, it does something different with the science when it engages with it. It doesn't simply say, well, here's, here's quantum physics and uh, here's string theory and here's um, here a bunch of math proofs. It doesn't give you that back, it transmutes it. And I think that is where theaters are kind of crucible and it, that's where the, interest, the interesting stuff happens. So I'm not suggesting that's anti-science, but I think we have to be careful about what we think theater's doing with science in the first place. Um, and it'll be interesting to see. I don't know what's going to happen with um, what the questioner is, is saying about the anti-science. Um, but theater has always had that space, that capaciousness to address uh, address all kinds of issues. So I wouldn't be surprised if we did get get more plays that do uh, address address that. The next question follows on actually logically from what from what you've been saying from the previous question. It's from your colleague actually, Bart Van S, who says. Wonderful discussion. That's very nice. He says, does a post-truth world, anti-vax, climate change denial, COVID denial, make scientific theatre more urgent or more problematic? That's, again, it follows on from what you've just been talking about. That's a really good question, Bart. Thank you for that. Um, well, more urgent. Yeah, in many ways it does. But again, I would probably shy away from thinking the theatre has some um, has some duty to to give us something um, ethical and moral in, in sort of definitive a definitive sense and sort of put the world to rights. So I think it, it's it's really about that that journey that it takes the audience on. It's if if we were handed a kind of here's what you need to do now manual um, by a play, I think that would be that would that would put people off actually. So I, I, I think, and Bart is a, a Shakespeareanist. He's he's an expert on this uh, as well. So I'd be interested to know what what the Shakespearean approach would be. But absolutely, it would it would seem to me that theatre will always be engaging with the ideas of of its time, and it won't necessarily have the answers. But it's always been fantastic posing the questions, and that's something that playwrights from Ibsen to Timberlake, Wharton Baker, have talked about this sense of I stop at giving the answer. I give you the question, but I don't give you some solution. Um, and that that's really striking that playwrights do want to deal with the most most contemporary and current problems, but they're not in the in the sort of game of of giving giving an answer necessarily. I'm not suggesting all of them take that approach, but many of them do see their role as to present problems but refrain from providing solutions. The next question touches on a subject we've already talked about in some ways. What do you think streaming theatre will mean for the future of theatre in terms of its availability, accessibility, the groups that otherwise might not have been exposed to theatre before? So in other words, streaming, is it, is, does it have a positive aspect as well as encouraging, as you said earlier, a stampede back into uh, communal theatres? Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely brilliant for getting more people to see theatre who um, then who might otherwise uh, have had access to it. So ex access is really important. Um, I guess I would just hope that that could continue to the extent of getting the physical bodies into the theaters. And um, I suppose one, one model that we have worked on for several years, actually colleagues and I at, at Oxford have developed a model of, um, of theater that it's a kind of 
mix of science and theater that is site specific and takes audiences from all over our communities to um, places like the Museum of the History of Science or the Natural History Museum and stages excerpts from plays, scenes from plays and songs and, and poems that are relevant to a particular scientific theme. Like we did one called the Contagion Cabaret, which was quite prescient. It was a couple of years ago and it was all about contagion. And uh, it was a combination of, of really thoughtful, serious, fun, uh, exciting, different, different cross-period examples of plays and, and, um, and other material that considered that theme, but in that particular space. And so some of the, the uh, surroundings were things like microscopes that would have been used, the actual microscopes used in, in detecting um, bacteria that were being discussed in, in, in a certain play, or, you know, it was really, it was quite atmospheric. Now, what we did during the pandemic in, in April and May was we turned that into a film. So you can actually go and watch the Contagion Cabaret on YouTube. It's up there. And it's one of these things that it was a collaboration with Theatre Chipping Norton. Um, and one of those moments when we came together to do something that would make an intervention in this awful period of the uh, lockdown, the first lockdown, but that would also help the theatre and would provide a sort of permanent record as well. So you can experience that Contagion Cabaret as a film, which originally was a performance. Um, so in a way, I, I hope that, that that gives an example of the kind of thing, sort of hybrid, that we are seeing perhaps more of. The, the idea that there's, as I said earlier, this flexibility that theater can do many things. It can work with film, but it can also remain in this um, physical, you know, face-to-face -face mode. Um, but it does seem that for survival, those those two things might need to happen, at least in the short term. I love the idea of the space influencing the co content, as it were, or the content and the space coming together in the way you described. I remember years ago, you can see a, a show directed by Neil Bartlett, and it was staged in a hospital in the East End of London. And we sat the audience as if we were students in an operating theatre. And indeed, one of the essays in your book makes that point, doesn't it? That there was a link, a, a direct verbal link between medicine and theatre, the operating theatre. And those, yes. those, um, those sort of ringed seats of, of rows where students would, you know, uh, watch dissection or medical processes had a theatrical quality to them. Um, I'd, I'd rush on, if I may, to another question. Um, yes. What, what is the difference between studying plays that write about science explicitly and studying theatre from a scientific perspective or to examine their impact on spectators? So is there, is there some, what is the, the difference? studying plays that write about science and studying theatre from a scientific perspective. Studying theatre from a scientific perspective, that, that is a fascinating idea. I'm guessing that maybe my father asked that question. Um, not not, okay. not just my father's name, Amy Cook. Which oh, I don't <laughs> okay, right. I can see, I, I should say, I, I can see some of the questioners, but not all of them. Amy, it's so great to hear from you. Um, Amy is the best person to answer this question. Um, so please read her chapter in the book. But uh, Amy, I mean, one thing that I've long been fascinated by is the, the idea that we might know what's happening inside the brain of somebody watching a play, watching, you know, going through an immersive theater production, experiencing and being, being surrounded. Um, what, you know, what's happening in the brain? Can you actually, ever do that and would that be desirable to put an audience you know put electrodes on an audience member or whatever it would take stick them in an mri i mean can we really know for sure what is going on scientifically lots of efforts have been made as as amy really really knows um and uh that's still an elusive question, and it's a great example of how you have multiple disciplines trying to tackle it. So there's a whole, uh, whole kind of um, approach that draws on psychology, so experimental psychology, neuroscience, cognition, to try to understand what an audience is experiencing um, scientifically. I'm getting the sense that uh, we may be coming to the final question. I've, I've just lost the panel with the question. Can we have one more question or not? Have we got time for one yeah, more? Time for one more, definitely. Okay, but this may be the last question. 
many younger authors trying to write science plays for perhaps the first time seem to gravitate towards ethical issues in science. What do you think of this trend, which can occasionally have an anti-science quality to it? That's from Stuart Barstein. Right. Um, so yeah, can, you, can we have the first part of it, the younger, younger playwrights? Many younger authors trying to write science plays for the first time seem to gravitate towards ethical issues. Mm. What do you think of this trend, which can occasionally have an anti-science quality to it? How do you keep ethical issues out of science, I would ask, actually? Don't the two things That's, sort of go together? Yeah, that is really interesting, Stuart. Hmm. Again, this is one of those where I want to fling it back to Stuart and have him answer it. <laughs> so Stuart wrote a whole book called Ignorance. Um, and he is a scientist who was a theater director before he became a scientist. So he's he's the perfect person to talk about this. Um, in in fact, I I really don't know the answer, Stuart. I mean, I wish I did, but one of the hard-nosed answers you might give is that funding bodies are very much at the forefront when you're an emerging playwright. Um, and there are bodies like the Wellcome Trust, uh, the Sloan Foundation, but the Wellcome Trust especially focuses on biomedical ethics, I believe it is. And so if, if you are seeking funding to write your first play, very often you might go to someplace like the Wellcome Trust and find that actually you have to deal with ethical issues, biomedical ethics, um, and, and that might be a driver. So that, that might be one, I'm sure you'd say perhaps lame answer. It doesn't really answer the whole question, but it does bring us back to the fact that that money is often at the heart of this, and uh, and there there is um, there is that kind of force that can come into play when you think about what gets staged and what gets written about. Can I just say I, that's a very fine answer? But I, I, for me, science plays automatically raise almost automatically raise ethical issues, ethical problems. But uh, that's just my personal view. But can I just say, um, this discussion, from my point of view, has been wonderful. And can I just add as well, uh, it captures something of the wide ranging nature of your book. Um, this is a book of enormous intellectual stimulus, because each essay is tackling, as we've implied, a different aspect of the subject. And I think we've touched on some of those issues. So thank you very much indeed, Kirsten, for this discussion. It's been great to talk to you.